So my name is Ataula Buriro, and uh, I'm from University of Venezia, Kofoskari. So here is my outline of the presentation. I will first try to motivate why exactly this research is needed. Uh, existing authentication solutions, for example, what do we have already? Why there exist some limitations? How to mitigate those limitations? And then I will try to propose my solution. We will end up with some conclusions. Okay, so now, how many of us don't use smart devices? Is there anyone who doesn't use any smart device? No. So 61%, actually 61% own a smart device, be it a tablet, smartwatch, smartphone, Google Glasses, for example. And by 2025, 72% of all the internet users, you know, will solely use smart devices, okay? Now, to be more specific, to be more precise, who doesn't own smartphones? Is there anyone who doesn't have a smartphone? We all use smartphones, right? So smartphones, why? Because they are extremely popular. They provide us anytime, anywhere computing, number one. Number two, they have powerful features like powerful batteries, long-lasting batteries, powerful processors, for example. And the most important thing is we use these smartphones every 6.5 minutes. So 150 times a day, we use these smart device, smartphones, for example, in shorter, in a longer, and in frequent sessions. So as a result, for example, global smart smartphone users increased by 49, up to 50% actually in, in these five years of, of period. And the UK has now become a smartphone society. So the popularity is still on the rise. What exactly we use these smartphones for? So basically they were developed only to, for, 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 voice, for communication, for example, sending voice, calling someone, receiving calls, but now we are using them for different sensitive operations. Sensitive, when I say sensitive, means we are doing transactions, we are doing, we are taking pictures, taking selfies, we are sharing with our friends, colleagues, for example. And this data is very sensitive, mind you. We use, you know, we use these devices to actually facilitate us. They are facilitating us, but the downside is they are somehow you know, saving your data, your sensitive data. So a lot of personal data is actually saved and uh, stored on your computer, on your phone. That data needs to be protected. How? How should we protect this data? What is authentication? So authentication is actually verifying the identity of a person. So I'm identified based on my badge here. This is a way of authentication. Now the point is, what do we have? We have multiple solutions like pins and passwords. How many of us use pins? How many? No. Perfect. So fingerprint, biometrics, we have these solutions. We have these options, right? And we have like different uh, biometric modalities. Some of them, they are very useful, like fingerprint, for example, face recognition. They are very useful on these things, but some of them, they are not very useful, like palm, we cannot have iris, for example, takes a lot of time. This part, this uh, behavioral part is red because I'm working in this particular point, particular area. Now, for the users of pins and passwords, you know, these pins and password-based authentication mechanisms, they are non-transparent. When I say non-transparent, it means you have to enter your pin and password every 6.5 minutes when you are accessing your phone, right? So in this way, they are non-transparent. Number two, they could be shared, they could be forgotten. Uh, you know, there are always some peeking eyes looking at you, what you are entering, for example. And uh, if you are using one, two, three, four as your password, you are not alone. 10% users, they use one, two, three, four as, as the pin on, your, on, on the computers, on, the, on their phones. Then we choose simple passwords, no? Why? Because simple passwords are easier to remember, but also, also, they are easier to be broken down. So users, in fact, 67% of the users, as per this report, 67% of the users, they are not using password-based authentication mechanisms anymore. Is there any alternate? Yes, biometrics. Biometrics at least, you know, at least provides you a flexibility not to remember something, right? So they are non-transparent as well. I told you, 
every 6.5 minutes, I mean, this is a study. Uh, they are also non-transparent unless the fingerprint is somehow very close in or in, on a device that, that is very, makes it very, very use, usable, for example. And they have attack vulnerability as well. Who still thinks fingerprint sensors are not hackable? They are hackable. Why? And also like iris recognition is also there. Iris means this, this black part in my eye. This could be used as uh, to authenticate person, okay? Now the point is Apple's iPhone 5S and Apple's iPhone 6S, they got hacked on the second day of their release by Chaos Lab Germany. So fingerprint sensors, to be honest, they are not very secure to be. And then like, they are too consuming, time consuming as well. If, like Fujisto has this iris recognition system. And you know, you, you have to, you have to, Every like uh, 6.5 minutes, for example, you have to look exactly into the position you are required to, to authenticate yourself, which will take too long, for example. Also like, maybe here you are not seeing face recognition. How many of you are, you know, are biased towards face recognition? Face recognition, for example, is good biometric modality, but you know, taking 150 times selfies is a problem, number one. Number two, privacy. So these are some concerns that my research actually tries to, to, to resolve. Anybody knows about behavioral biometrics? What exactly is behavior? The behavioral biometrics is like the identification of a person based on his actions. Okay, like how I walk is behavioral biometric. How I type, behavior, not what I type, how I type is behavioral biometric. How I speak, behavioral biometric. So these are all the behavioral modalities that could be used to authenticate person. And they are very secure. They are, they doesn't require any data collection, any uh, hardware particularly, and unobtrusive data collection. Now my solution. I'm proposing a tetra model biometric authentication solution. This solution is not, to be honest, not, not for just an ordinary user. When I say ordinary user who is just using smartphone for call making or call answering, no. This is for someone who actually practice security. So this solution is user friendly. When I say user friendly, it means it doesn't require you to remember anything. No, not at all. And it doesn't require any specific like five minutes of walk to authenticate yourself, no. What it requires is like the way you swipe on the touch screen, you see the trajectory, you have to swipe on this touch screen, which re hardly requires 500 milliseconds. Then you are, re you are free to choose a combination of four to eight digit free text. Free text means you could use one, two, three, four. You could use four zeros as your password, for example, and then write your name. All these modalities, you know, they are very, very simple and we are practicing them every day. Another fourth modality is hidden, which means how you are holding your phone. So you hold your phone, now you have started doing all these three gestures, at the end of the day you have four modalities to, to decide whether you are the person who you are claiming. Existing hardware is sufficient enough, I don't require any additional hardware. Built-in sensors, accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer, they are sufficient enough. Even touch screen is sufficient enough. So it use, utilizes the existing hardware. Then for the data collection, for example, we, we, we validate this research using uh, a study involving real users, and we had like uh, three different strategies, three different body postures, sitting, standing, and walking, and 20 participants actually participated in this experiment, and we conducted this experiment on S21, Samsung Galaxy S21. And you see here features extracted. So the features are, you know, time signals, yeah, that you leave your traces on the X and Y plane, for example, then how you entered four digit or six digit or eight digit pin, how, not what. How means, how long did you press the key? How, how, sorry, how long did you press the key and when you release it, what was exactly the time? And what, what exactly was the time between the two keys? And then you have how you hold your phone. Statistical features, very simple. And because the device has, this application has to run on the phone. So we have to come up with something really, really quick. And this is our approach. So we did score level fusion, all the modalities for one class classification, and then they are fused together to form a score, okay? And if the score in is increased by a certain threshold, user is authenticated, otherwise no. 
Another so problem we are facing in authentication is few samples, number of samples. Users are reluctant to provide you many samples. So we apply it again on the real device, on the, comp on the phone, for example, to increase the number of samples. So if you are happy providing me 30, 40, 50 number of samples, then I can increase up to 100, for example, or thousands. So this is the structure of my can I developed. And this is the strategy, strategy to evaluate. So first you train and test on your data, then you, you know, you in, generate the GAN and then you test it. So the results, this is actually the proof of the concept of our application. And the results suggest that we are already, with just 30 samples of data, we are already reaching 92.5% accuracy. And here the success metric accuracy means how accurately the, 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 the classifier authenticated you. And on this part, for example, this part, you see that this accuracy actually increases when you are using increased number of samples, up to 60, let's say. So which is this, for example? So on original data, for example, this true accept rate is how many times the actual user was authenticated, 92.96. And augmented on the trending, on the increased number of samples, you know, how many times the, the, the legitimate user was accepted, you see there is a certain increase. But the only limitation is like this, uh, Tests were carried out only on few users. So there is a still a potential we need to do. Uh, conclusion, for example, these are just the summary of what I did. We need to involve more tester you to, to get some concrete results, more testers, cross-vendor testing, and in multiple scenarios. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, we still have lots of time for questions, so if there are any questions from the audience, we can take them now. Yes, please. Uh, first of all, very, very interesting idea. I like it very much. Um, I have some questions about pra the, the practical implications. Uh, well, actually, applications. Uh, how can you guarantee that, uh, like the iris, right, the retina? I have to look at the camera. We know that that's unique per person, in a sense. How can you guarantee that the way you swipe a finger in, in, in a thing is also unique per person and, and not uh, an in here can also do it in the same way? And yeah, that, that would be the question. OK. Thank you very much for, for your interest. Now, the question is, how you find uniqueness in this second swipe, right? So the point is, it is for sure that you are only touching those specific points mentioned as a trajectory, right? It's perfectly fine. But how much pressure you are applying, number one. How quickly you are, you are doing this swipe, for example. And how much size of the finger you are applying to do so. It's extremely different from person to person. That makes this modality very, very unique. You know, and for same the case with uh, with uh, keystrokes and with the signature as well. You, so you you everybody has different speed, different fingertip size, finger pressure, for example, applying to write something on the touch screen. It's extremely different. That's why it makes sense. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, do you have other questions? Uh, I was. I'm. I'm curious about uh, how you. We propose your model. It's more like a multi, uh, multi classification, multi category classification, or a binary classification. Because I imagine if we put that on the phone, it's more like a binary classification, and yes or no, if the person is the owner of the, the phone or not. And in this case, if you calculated the precision and recall, because talking about security is interesting to see. I think the the false negatives, right? If the uh, the tool is allowing a person to access that phone or not? Okay, thank you for asking, George. Now the question is, yes, it's a, it's a kind of a binary class classification, but it is not exactly binary class classification. I'm saying why. So in binary class classification, you are required to train your model on the samples of two classes at least, right? Here not is the case. So in smartphone authentication scenario, my model, my classifier needs to be trained only on my data only. So it's a one class classification problem. Now, when I train my model on my data, when I'm testing it on my own data, it will return me false rejections or true acceptances, right? For you, it will be false acceptances or true rejections, right? This is how we, we conduct methodology. This is how we conduct our experiments. 
I hope I answered your question.